My name is Christian Schregel. I'm a journalist, um, biologist by training, and I uh, am a book author. I have written a book about the Anthropocene, which is the idea of a new geological era. I became a journalist out of curiosity. Uh, I think journalism is a great way to uh, always have the possibility to ask questions uh, and to try and go see things, go talk to people. Um, you can always learn, you can always try and, um, and get a, a really hands-on understanding and then express it and get into communication with readers or viewers. And so I think it's a very lively process, uh, journalism, and one that is a little bit linked to science because our facts need to be checked as well. Um, so as a trained scientist, I quite, I quite li like that aspect as well. Uh, first of all, I think we should, uh, as journalists, we should, should not uh, look down on our readers and think uh, they need explanation in a, in a way. I think uh, our readers in most cases will be uh, at least as smart as we are as journalists. Um, but what we need to do, what is our task first, is to be uh, like a connective tissue in the society. So the word medium itself, it already means that we are connect, uh, that we connect people from different backgrounds, different expertises, different education backgrounds and so on. So I think first of all, what is really important and what is the challenge is to bring across complex topics like, for example, mine now, the Anthropocene, a geological, comp uh, geological topic in question, big question that uh, affects everybody, right, in a way that uh, it uh, becomes visible, feelable, tangible to a lot of people. And that is uh, the narrative challenge, right, how to tell a story in a way that people get interested in the first place because we live in a society where attention has become like an industrial commodity almost. Uh, and to grab the attention, or already the grabbing I think is not a very good idea, but to attract the attention in a way uh, that um, doesn't oversell your story, but that is like a, a natural attention process. Like when you're in a forest, you see an interesting bird, that attracts your attention and my story needs to be like that bird in a forest uh, attracting attention, right? So um, in the time when I wrote my book, The Anthropocene, uh, this was um, the first version came out in 2010 in German. So I wrote it in say 28, 29. The word Anthropocene was not very much known. And I think this is a big idea that deserves attention and it deserves critical reflection. And so I felt also that it connects to a lot of what I have done in my journalistic uh, career and also in my thinking as a biologist. And the word Anthropocene and the concept is a new way to look at um, the planet and humanity's um, position in on the planet. And so the Anthropocene really allowed me to align a lot of the topics I had covered as a journalist and a lot of the future challenges we, we face um, and also um, bring in uh, more to the environmental debate than just scientific facts in a way, uh, bring in cultural reflection, bring in philosophical reflection, bring in artists' perspectives. So it allowed me to open up my own field in a way and in the book to try and tell stories um, of how many people start to think about the planet in a new way. The core idea of the Anthropocene first is that the changes we humans bring about on this planet, they are not short term, we are not scratching on the surface of planet Earth and just in case we would be extinct or something, this would become invisible in a very short time. It's the opposite. The idea is that we are at the moment creating a long-lasting geological biological change to this planet, which changes the f all future of planet Earth, the future of evolution, the future of geology. And to um, feel this long-lasting impact we have, this is not about a short-term change, this is about a global long-lasting change. We reorganize planet Earth. That's the first point I want to bring across. But something that is even more important to me is the question whether the Anthropocene is just the sum of all environmental problems, 
in which case, like climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, in which case actually we would have to fight against it and we would have to try to stay or get back to the previous geological epoch because if the Anthropocene is just the sum of all problems, it would necessarily be a really bad thing. So my message really of the book is that, hey, let's start thinking about a different type of Anthropocene. Is a good Anthropocene possible? What can we do to start create a, a positive legacy uh, for the future? And this is really what I want to invite people to discuss and think about. Well, actually, the idea is, has a long um, history behind it. And already in the 19th century, or actually 18th century, people started to describe the sum of all human actions and what they do with on, on, on Earth. And actually, what Earth does with us, that's very important as well. Um, what is new about the idea, which was then formulated in around the year 2000 by a, a Nobel laureate chem in chemistry co uh, called Paul Crutzen, a Dutch scientist, um, was that the Anthropocene, in a nutshell, sums up all the changes. So today, we have very specialized discussions about climate change here, about conservation here, about genetic technology here, about synthetic biology here. And these um, discussions do not have many links. The Anthropocene idea links all these fields into one word and one idea that uh, we humans are not like a, a, a separate force that is um, living from an external environment uh, drawing from it and dumping uh, its waste, for example, into it, into this external environment, but that humans have become by their own action really, um, in brackets, what I think they have always been, but it conceptually we return to a state where we are integral parts of the environment uh, in a paradoxical way, actually, by polluting it or by changing the climate, human action becomes uh, feelable, visible, everywhere, right? So this is not just impact in a small sense, but it's fundamental change. Uh, for example, take an orchid that grows in the middle of the remotest rainforest on Earth, right? So you would think of this as a wild plant. But in the future, at least one third or perhaps even half of its biomass will be built with carbon molecules that have gone through exhaust pipes or a factory chimney because we add through our actions so much carbon to the atmosphere and the plants suck it from the atmosphere and build their bodies from it. So even in this remotest orchid, in the remotest rainforest, you have human action, right? And uh, this realization um, is something new. It's, it, it leaves behind the old environmental story of man versus nature and creates a more integrated view of, well, man in nature or nature in, in, in humans, yeah. So the Anthropocene book first, it had a huge impact, I have to say, uh, because it uh, helped to create two large projects in uh, Germany and with international um, uh, attractiveness. One is the Anthropocene project at the House of World Cultures, Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin. Uh, together with the Max Planck Research Society and the German Technology Museum, Deutsches Museum, and the International uh, Institute, for, uh, the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. It was a three-year project actually funded by the German Parliament to explore the Anthropocene idea. And at the same time, I, w I became part of the project for a special exhibition at the Deutsches Museum, German Technology Museum, about the Anthropocene. So as an author, I'm really grateful um, that uh, the topic has grown. It was not like a, a cul de sac and nothing happened with it. It, be it be now becomes a real big international topic and um, the book helped to, to shape these two um, endeavors. Um, and with uh, the Analog Revolution book, which is really about how nature and technology are fusing and becoming one, um, the uh, Reactions are uh, interesting in a, in, because uh, it really bridges two spheres, the one of internet nerds and the one of conservation-oriented biotypes. And I'm trying to think the future of these two areas, nature and technology, I'm trying to put that together 
and for example develop the idea of an internet that not only includes us humans and not only includes like the internet of things fridges and cars and so on but an internet that includes a bird species or birds and plants and, and mountains and the oceans through sensors and other feedback uh, possibilities and I think this is an idea that's a bit uh, uh, um, uh, that needs more exploration and I'm um, still uh, uh, um, exploring ways to bring that idea uh, into more like exhibition concepts and, and other um, formats. Economists study the history of their own field. Uh, I, I think it's really important to see how much it uh, is based on what is called dualism, uh, separation of spheres. Separation, for example, of tradable uh, goods that have a monetary value and nature, wilderness, which has no monetary value. So in classic economics, um, a living forest uh, that uh, provides us with like fresh air, cooler climate, pharmaceutical resources uh, has no zero value, right? Um, only when it's uh, logged or when the animals get killed or when the pharmaceuticals get extracted, you get a value, right? And so this very much is a dualist approach. Yeah? You ignore, you don't attribute any value to the actual system and you only give value to what you extract from it after you've killed it, basically. And um, this Anthropocene challenge to really put us back into uh, connectedness for me means for an economist to think about ways how can we actually attribute value to the living systems that we support us, that we are part of, and without which no economy would exist. So it's really important to see that economy is a subset of ecology. And, um, and to understand the field as this, not as the dominant uh, master of uh, um, all things we do, but as a subset of uh, ecology. Just one really important uh, historical fact when Alexander von Humboldt, the great naturalist, uh, started his career, he wanted to become a, a, an economist, actually a, a budget a man uh, in charge of uh, the royal budget. And the first thing he had to do in the economist school at the time was to create a herbarium, a pl collection of plants, because nature was seen as the basis for any sort of economy. So I think this is a great inspiration and I would wish that at a school for economy actually people would start with activities like that to see that nature is the ultimate bank and like seed stocks for plants are our ultimate central bank. Uh, that's what we actually live from. We don't live from derivatives that are um, sent around uh, through computers, uh, billions of virtual dollars or euros, but that's what we live from, the central bank of nature. And so an economy of the future needs to recognize that and break this dualism. Um, and so I think the uh, economists of today uh, have a great, uh, great challenge um, to really change the whole concept of their field and integrate themselves into our planet. Because so far the economic doctrines, they uh, are formulated in a way that you think they, they don't they, they are not connected with the planet. It's like a system that is disconnected from the water, from the glaciers, from the forests, from the creeks, from the birds, from the plants, everything that makes us alive, the economy is disconnected from. And this, to make this connection, I think, is the biggest challenge uh, for economists today. I would have become uh, probably a ranger in a, a, a nature reserve somewhere because that's what I studied, vegetation analysis. Um, and I actually applied for a job at English Nature uh, to become like a conservation biologist. Um, I yeah, sometimes still think this is uh, something I should have done. I really like spending time in nature, like observing birds and so on. But uh, the journalism really gives you access to a much wider field of topics and uh, allows you to interact with people uh, in a wonderful way. So uh, I'm actually quite happy that I've become a journalist.